Hello, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. I just love coming to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia. It's where I get all my fine woodworking tools and a great woodworking education. Let me show you what we've got on the big show today. This time on the Highland Woodworker, we're saying goodbye. A look at some of our favorite features. So you're right, this is a very expensive piece of lumber. And moments with masters. <laughs> Sorry that the camera's off. <laughs> well, that's good. Use it if you want to. Plus the finer points on creating perfect hinge mortises from our friends at Fine Woodworking Magazine. These stories and more this time on the final episode of The Highland Woodworker. Welcome to the final episode of The Highland Woodworker. During the past six years, we've had a wonderful time meeting with master woodworkers all across our country and learning about all things woodworking. Now, during this episode, we're going to show you some of our favorite clips and see if you remember them and enjoy them as much as we have. Hold on, Charles. Why are you skewing that plane? Plane maker Ron Brees informed me on how to use one of his perfectly made smooth planes. When you plane, you've got to turn it sideways so that it'll lift. But Chuck, I've gone through a lot of trouble to make this plane at 55 degrees so it'll handle tough grain like curly cherry with a quarter sawn edge with curl faces coming through it. The best way to plane this is with the full pitch of the 55 degrees running straight down the board. Well, let's see what it'll do. Ho oh, ho! That is beautiful. Yeah, now, is that what it's all about? That's pretty impressive, Chuck. But the real result is right here. That's why you have a plane. One of the most exciting moments for me was getting to know woodworker and former president Jimmy Carter. It's so nice it's to, good to be with you. And you know, Holland Hardware means a lot to me. I've known them ever since they began in business. Yeah, Chris Bagby is just yeah. a wonderful guy. And, and uh, I think one of the ideas about this show, the Highland Woodworker, is I'm a Highland Woodworker. You probably yes, could say you're one I too. I am too, yes. I've been to uh, uh, classes there to learn how to be a better woodworker. And uh, I uh, had a class there by Terry Freed, uh, who also made a stool and gave it to me as a result of that. But uh, I've uh, learned a lot from them. and and use that literature and, and I'm a regular customer of that. Nothing beats building a Rubo bench with French oak that grew during the time Parisian master Andre Rubo was living. We spent a warm summer day in rural Georgia following dozens of woodworkers who took that mighty big challenge. Well, it takes time, it takes uh, money and tools and other things and you have to have a certain skill level. Uh, what has really gratified me is that among the cohort we have working with us, uh, there's, there's nobody that I've seen that this project is over their head. It is definitely not a beginner's project, but if you're careful and you have mastery of a few tools, you know, if you know how to measure and if you know how to cut straight and cut square and you have a mallet and a chisel, you can pretty much build one of these, but doing it in a time schedule like this is, is a challenge. There's no doubt about that. We found that technology has even influenced the work of some hand tool Windsor chair makers, like Greg Pennington, who showed us how lasers have replaced sliding bevels in his work. We have a, a pattern here that has the sight lines for the legs. We map out our seat. The sight lines are the angles that the drill will be held at. Now I've got a perpendicular line to that and the laser set at the angle we're going to drill the hole. This one's set at 90 degrees, this one's set at 19 degrees. It makes a nice cross hatch that the drill can follow. Um, this is, happens to be a front leg, so let me uh, line this up and you can just see the laser coming over the center axis of the drill and then we just simply pull the trigger.
In our Louisville Slugger feature, we got a first-hand look at what is arguably the most valuable piece of lumber in the world. This is a Babe Ruth bat from 1927, the year that the Babe hit his 60 home runs. This is from that famous Yankees Murderer's Row team you know, said to be the greatest offensive lineup in baseball history. Well, for woodworkers, this is an expensive piece of lumber. <laughs> you better believe it. If you look around the oval logo right there, you'll see 21 notches carved around it. And what Babe Ruth did is he carved a notch like an Old West gunslinger for every home run that he hit with this bat. There are 21 notches on this bat, so he hit 21 or over a third of his record 60 home runs in 1927 with this bat. And it has been valued by all the people in the memorabilia and collectibles industry at a million and a half dollars. So you're right, this is a very expensive piece of lumber. We're in Columbia, Tennessee, the home of James Curry, and I've heard that Mr. Curry has a great collection of almost everything, especially woodworking tools. Let's go see. So I've been collecting these about 40 years. Got a 12 or 12 bay that's nothing but household stuff and kitchen stuff. Then I got a blacksmith and horseshoeing band. Then I come to the back, I've got a cobbler's band. Then I got a farm band. Then I treasure it because of the history that they used on the farm. Then outside, I've got a mule-drawn plow collection. I was raised on a, in, in L.A., Lower Alabama, picking cotton. And I got one of the sacks hanging up right there that I picked cotton with. This is why I came. This is a tremendous collection of wooden hand planes, and no two are alike, are they? No, sir. Th this is just great. You've got some rounds and you got some hollows it looks like and these were all handmade by artisans to use for themselves yes. pretty much yes yeah now here's one that's pretty good now that's a beauty it's got knickers that. uh huh and a skewed blade and this is the sole here right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah Oh, just, just beautiful. Come on in. Welcome to Lotes House. Glad to have you. Hey, this is great. Now, you were telling me about the staircase. Yes, this, this, this is Johann Alberts. This is his, his masterpiece. And in the last test one takes at this point in time in the 19th century, moving from journeyman to master is you must design and then you must build a staircase. And so when you walk in this home and you see this, this is the crowning glory for his home because this is what he has spent time, energy, and effort to earn master woodworking status. Well, it's cantilevered. Yes, freestanding, cantilevered, free-forming wraparound. The architectural essence of this piece blows people away, but the woodworkers should come and say, JT, the compound bend and twist would be very difficult to accomplish today with all of our technology, but to do this all by hand Mid-19th century, 1855, 56, 57, truly is remarkable. He is a master, master woodworker. Bill, it looks like that you're about a 18th century a frontier woodworker. Is that the idea? That is the idea. Our premise here at Mansker Station is to provide an insight as to what life was like at these forded stations out here on the Cumberland frontier. So this is your lathe, and I see uh, some of the major parts of the lathes that we use today. Commonly There's... used today, very, very much so. And uh, as, as we see, um, we have headstocks or puppets sure. uh, on this lathe, just as we mm -hmm. have on modern lathes today. A tool uh, rest. Tool rest, exactly. And uh, I love the fact that when uh, Brian designed this one, he made it to where I could move it in and out and around uh, sure. pretty much well. Um, <clears throat> I mean, works wonderfully. This uh, particular lathe is a uh, uh, derivative of an early French lathe. It is a spring pole lathe. This one actually has a small four and a half foot hickory spring down here on the side. And what I love about this one, whereas most spring pole lathes that I encounter are uh, very high speed, this particular lathe is very high torque. Oh. So it might take a little more oomph, so to speak, to get her to turn. Mm -hmm. But boy, once she starts turning. Is that right? Woo! <laughs> 
I mean, she is ready to cut. This, and you'll notice, I'm coming up on this side of the stock because as I push down, I'm gonna want this stock to turn towards me. Mm -hmm. And what I'll do is I'll do a couple of turns here on this far end, which will go ahead and give me more of a smooth surface and then I'll swap everything around and I'll actually be able to achieve the speeds that I need to do my turning. All right, and now's when I usually tell the folks, plug your ears because she's fixing to get loud. how fast it works. The sound's not so bad. No, it's not, not as bad. You can come here and really feel and see what the 18th century woodworker in the frontier was like. Very much thank so. Thank you so much, Chuck, thank Bill. you for coming out. I've enjoyed having you all out here today. And uh, tell you what, why don't you hang on to that coat for your trip back? Oh, you I'm, might, I'm gonna you need might it. Have to, might have to need that to stay warm with. Well, thank you. You're gonna have to fight me for it anyway. <laughs> Well, Ed, I have ruined many a turning project with some of these older type tools, but there are some innovations in turning tools. There are some innovations, and you're right. A lot of us turning, trying to ride that bevel and find the perfect way to present the tool to the piece have had catches, and you can cause a, a, a ruination in a moment, so to speak. But Carter, who's been known for making the bandsaw accessory products for a very long time is now making a wonderful tool uh, for wood turners called the axe. All right. It feels good. Yeah. Feels well, the really innovations are... It's flat on the bottom. Right. Uh, that allows it to then let the operator put it flat on the tool rest and with the carbide tips that they include, it just cuts like a dream and you don't have to have that learning curve of how to ride the bevel, especially as, a new, as a, a new turner, someone doing it for the first time. And you don't have to invest in sharpening equipment, which could set you back five, six hundred dollars right off. Right, yeah, with standard turning tools, bench grinder, grinding wheels, a jig system to hold the tool to the wheels, all that is not necessary with a Well, this with looks product. good. And look at the whole flat here, it's well thought out. Yeah, they decided that uh, and it, it is, it's comfortable like an ax handle, that little bit of flat right there. And turners will also tuck it to their side to make that nice smooth transition cut using the body. And that uh, just it makes for a very comfortable tool to, to hold for long term. Yeah, it's, it's all about control here and control there to keep from rolling over and uh, messing up the work and it's going to be sharp. It, it's, it's great. They've got three, three uh, profiles, the round cutter, uh, the diamond cutter, and then they have a, a square cutter. They also include a little radius square cutter as well. So you can do a lot of projects with it. And the color-coded furl lets you kind of look at a glance and be able to grab it at the lathe. Well, that's outstanding. Uh, I, think, uh, I think these are going to find a home in many shops. Well, I think Turners are going to really appreciate them. Coming up, your box or cabinet project could all hinge on a simple jig. Find Woodworking Magazine's Matt Kinney will explain in the finer points. I'd used block planes before, but there was something that just like I flipped in my head that day. A look back at some memorable moments with Masters. I feel like my family is inspired, even Shakespeare, to write. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. I'm just an average, down-to-earth woodworker. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'm probably about a 5. But one place I score a perfect 10 is right here. And I plan on keeping all 10. That's why I have a saw stop table saw. And there's more. Plenty of power, superior dust collection, and absolute accuracy. These features have made it the best-selling cabinet saw in America. Let Highland Woodworking help you put a saw stop in your shop. 
Whiteside Machine Company has been in business for over 30 years providing customers with quality American-made router bits. Fine Woodworking Magazine has declared Whiteside router bits best overall and best value when compared against 17 other brands. No matter the router application, they have the type and profile of carbide router bit you need. When you put a white side router bit to work in your shop, it is guaranteed to make you smile. What is quality? Is it quick? Forgettable? Easy? No, it isn't quick or easy. It isn't forgettable. Quality takes work. It takes time. Quality lasts, and it starts at Bell Forest, a leading global supplier of figured and exotic woods. Order online at bellforestproducts.com. Woodworkers count on American-made forest saw blades for smooth, quiet cuts every time, without splintering, scratching, or tear-outs. The famous Woodworker 2 is the all-purpose combination blade. But for special cuts, Woodworker 2s are available for cutting dovetails, for flat bottom joinery. A 30-tooth blade is perfect for ripping, a 48-tooth blade for superior cross cuts, and a finger joint blade set. There is a perfect forest Woodworker 2 for every table saw cut. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for more than 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year-round, ranging from how to hand cut dovetails and mortises to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair, or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, just look in their catalog or go to highlandwoodworking.com. If you've ever made a box with a hinged lid, then you know how hard it can be to get the mortises perfectly aligned. But with a simple jig and a trim router, you can get accurate, repeatable mortises. With just a few alterations to the jig, you can also use it for cabinet hinges. Here's how it works, starting with the box hinge jig. The jig is quite simple. It's two pieces of half-inch MDF. One is the base with a notch for the hinge leaf, and the other is the fence, which fits into a groove in the base. Notice that there's a groove on both sides of the base. At the table saw, I make a series of cuts to define a shallow groove on one side of the base. When that's done, I flip the base over and make a shallow groove on the second face. These grooves locate the fence on the base. Now you're ready to cut the notch for the leaf. To do this, put the hinge on the NDF and trace around it with a pencil. Make sure to account for the barrel location. With the hinge notch laid out, you can make two defining cuts at either end and then nibble out the waist between them. All that's left now is to attach the fence to the base and then we can start routing. Now we're ready to route the mortises. I'll do that with a bearing guided flush trim bit and my trim router. I'll start by aligning the jig with the back of the box. Then I'll clamp the jig in place with the fence set against the box side. Clamp the box to the bench top and use the hinge leaf to set my cutting depth. Once 
once you've routed the first mortise, leave the jig in place. You can use it as a guide to score up the corners with the chisel. With the first mortise routed in the box bottom, I'll use the jig now to route the first mortise in the top. Clamp the jig to the lid, clamp the lid to the bench, and route away. That's a good fit. So is that one. All right, to route the last two mortises, all you need to do is take the fence off this side and put it over on this side, and then everything else is the same. The jig works great for boxes, and with a few modifications, it also works great for cabinets and their doors. All you need to do is change where and how the fence is located. The jig is still made from two pieces of half inch MDF. There's a notch in the base, and there's a notch in the fence. And that's because it's attached to the front of the jig, and that provides clearance for the router bit. Now route both mortises in the door. transfer their locations to the cabinet, and then route both mortises in the cabinet. That's it. There's no need to switch the fence's location with this one. Those fit great. All I gotta do is attach the hinges to the door, and then I can move on to my next project. Coming up. And, uh, you know, my friends are like, Mary, why don't you just carve a normal pumpkin like everybody else? <laughs> a stroll down memory lane. Some special moments with masters. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. Highland Woodworking stocks a wide selection of Rikon power tools known for their innovative design and rugged durability. Highland has sold thousands of Rikon's industry-leading bandsaws with sizes to fit every woodworking need, from the compact affordable 10-inch model to competitively priced 14 and 18-inch models. Shop us also for Rikon's reliable planers, lathes, and professional low-speed grinder, all with an exceptional five-year warranty. Rikon. Power tools. Are your tools Tormac sharp? Tormac, consistent, reliable, and razor sharp. Tormac, sharpening innovation. For 35 years, Lee has manufactured the world's best joinery jigs. From our award-winning dovetail jigs and mortise and tenon jigs, to newer innovations like router table jigs. Easily add strong, beautiful joinery to your woodworking pieces, like half-blind dovetails, box joints, mortise and tenon joints, and through dovetails. Lee, simply the easiest and most versatile router joinery jigs. Moment with a Master is brought to you by Highland Woodworking. Fine tools since 1978. Let Highland's legendary wood slicer resaw blade help make it easy for you to get great results sawing thick lumber into thinner boards. The wood slicer is designed to cut much faster, smoother, and quieter than ordinary bandsaw blades. You'll be amazed at how smooth a surface you'll get with a wood slicer. Its variable tooth pattern greatly reduces noise and vibration. Order a wood slicer from Highland Woodworking for your bandsaw today. We're in the Highland Woodworking classroom at the master's bench. And a lot of iconic woodworkers of the day 
have worked at this bench and shared their knowledge. People like Jeff Miller and Mary May, uh, Roy Underhill and Peter Galbert, and a host of others through the years. It's been my honor to be the host and producer of The Highland Woodworker, bringing you uh, features and, and woodworking that uh, hopefully you have enjoyed. And I want to introduce you to somebody very special. This is Chris Bagby. He's the owner and co-founder of Highland Woodworking. Uh, Chris, would you like to say something about the show? Well, <clears throat> it's been a pleasure uh, working with you these last six or seven years on uh, this project, the, the Highland Woodworker TV show. One of the things that has kept us in business for now close to 40 years has been our uh, emphasis on woodworking education. And this show has allowed us to not only teach people and reach out further beyond however many people can come to this classroom, but it also has helped inspire a lot of people. That's one of the hallmarks of the Highland Woodworker has been that it's an inspiration to help people uh, pursue a higher level of competence and take on more challenging projects and learn more skills. Well, we've had, like I said, lots of these woodworkers on the show and we've got some great clips through the six years and 34 episodes that we want to share with you. Let's go to some of those now. I'm a TV woodworker, and uh, I learned the trade from my great uncle because he went back. He was a radio woodworker. And, what? Uh, yeah, so he'd teach dovetailing over the radio. No, you and you, furniture you, you building. No, kidding. no, no. He taught uh, furniture building, and uh, it was what you know. He'd do the Chippendale High Boy on a radio series which they thought was going to be really difficult because you couldn't show anything, but then they realized they didn't have to build a damn thing. You know, all they had to do was make the sound effects. So they go, wow, that drawer came out perfect there, didn't it? Great. You know, so this was wonderful back in, so that's who I learned a lot of this uh, trade as a TV woodworker from. William Underhill sold Shakespeare, the Shakespeare family, the house that he lived in, the new place. Uh, so I got the, the uh, and Shakespeare wrote a, bunch of th uh, references to that. <laughs> There's a line in Shakespeare who says, uh, he shall join you as they join Wayne's green timber, and one of you shall prove a shrunk panel, and like green timber, warp, warp. So I think he's talking about bad woodworking, pulling apart, and I feel like my family is inspired, even Shakespeare, to write. So that's the oldest underhill in this business. Uh, and then I, growing up in Washington, D.C., way up in the mountainous part, so I'm up in the hills in D.C., and my mama, I always take my ax to school and do what I could on the way home to bring back something interesting. Years later, Roy apologized for getting carried away with his tall tales, some of which he turned into a book, Calvin Cobb, Radio Woodworker. One of the greatest engineer woodworkers is Brian Boggs, who is known for his exquisite post and rung chairs. No matter what he is doing, if the tool isn't right, he'll just make it himself. This is the first tool I ever made. Uh, this is a tobacco knife I built when I was about 19. Uh, I learned how to cut tobacco when I was 13 years old. It was my first job ever. Yeah. And I cut tobacco every season until I was 23. But this, uh, it was about time to get a knife. I did not like the ones that were made because they just had straight handles and the blade, I didn't like the shape of the blade and it hurt. I wanted a lightweight springy handle because when you cut tobacco, you grab the plant like this and then you spear it up. But well, when you hit that spear, the knife goes like this and it pulls on a little muscle here. Well, you, if you're cutting a thousand six a day, that's 6,000 plants. That's 6,000 of these over a six hour period or seven hour period. That's intense. You were working on details back then. Oh, evaluating yeah. all the tools. <laughs> That's bet. where Brian Boggs came yeah. from. Now is Thomas Lee Nielsen coming out with us? <laughs> I don't think their clientele are really big into cutting tobacco. <laughs> Master woodworker, author, and conservator Don Williams gave us an exclusive look inside master craftsman H.O. Studley's iconic tool chest. Many of these are on movable panels that, that uh, flip up and you can look behind them and see varying tools at multiple depths. 
And for example, you've got this amazing, exquisite little Prentice jeweler's vise mounted to a small slab of Santo Domingo mahogany, the whole of which hangs in its own stirrup back here, along with precision tools. Uh, this is a piece that he made. These are some sterret or other measuring tools, completely hidden from sight to the casual observer. And yet when you lay this down, you see yet another layer. And what you probably couldn't see is in the back, you see this, this blade of a, of a, a protractor square. That's completely hidden, hung on the back side of this, so you don't really get to appreciate it. And then you can move to a panel like this, which includes my favorite vignette. This is this right here is as beautiful as as human art gets in my mind. It's flawless in its its design and its execution. You have again uh, really the best tools that were available. He didn't buy anything that wasn't the best tool. He didn't make anything that wasn't the best tool. So there was a real key for that, and yet you can lift this up and some of the tools are a little bit um, quirky about the way they stay or don't stay in place and that you look underneath and there's another layer and then you can remove that and there's another layer behind that, behind both of these. So the, uh, the real takeaway from all of this is the depth and three-dimensionality of it. Alf Sharp is one of the world's most sought after 18th century furniture makers. From his talked about tables, beautiful beds, designer desks, clocks, chairs, and even complicated cabinets, period furniture maker could be Alf's middle name. My parents had a, had a book in their library of uh, 18th century English furniture, just a collection, a picture book. And there was this secretary in there. There was a two-page spread. Uh, it's like the centerfold. <laughs> and the, <laughs> this is furniture. The idea of a secretary and a two-page spread, I've tried to stay away from that. It gets me in trouble every time. <laughs> Sorry that the camera's on. <laughs> well, that's good. Use it if you want to. Furniture porn. <laughs> Most days you will find Jeff Miller here in his workshop. It sits hidden off of one of North Chicago's main streets. It was originally built to house a post office and later a bowling alley. Jeff has spared this old place where it now serves as his very own creative complex. His furniture is breathtaking. It's designed for form and function. Design is always such a fascinating part of this. To someone on the outside, it appears like you're, you're plucking this idea out of thin air and turning it into something. It, it seems like it's almost a magical process. And it's not. I mean, it's a lot of work. It's a process where you learn to look for solutions in what's around you and um, then work really hard to implement those and get it so that it works. Decades ago, woodworker Jim Tolpin took a chance that really paid off. A friend of his told him about a growing need for boat builders in the Pacific Northwest. Yes, there was work, and yes, it did pay double of what I could ever earn in New England for, for doing uh, boat work. And uh, so we moved out here, and I immediately got a job at a local uh, boat yard. The boat yard was located in Port Townsend, Washington, a charming artist community about 40 miles northwest of Seattle. They were assembling these really beautiful uh, cutters. Uh, I worked on that but ended up actually shifting back toward where my real expertise was at that point, which was custom cabinet work. I'd already done quite a bit of that in New England before, uh, and that was there was even more work and better pay in that realm. So. I uh, set up a cabinet shop in Port Townsend and built it. I was probably doing a, a kitchen, kitchen set a month at least, kitchen and a couple vanities uh, per month. The writing was an outgrowth of the ca custom cabinet business because what I was doing there was I was trying to find the most efficient process I could in order to compete. And I did figure it out and I realized what I had done is I just wrote a book on how to 
how to build custom cabinets in, in a small shop, in a garage. And I said, you know, other people would really be interested in reading this. So I really just had no interest in handwork whatsoever. I mean, I just, I, I wanted a circular saw for Christmas and, um, uh, you know, just something in my head went off and it was uh, back then in about 90, 91, 92. Uh, I, I bought a block plane from Walmart, a little blue block plane, and it worked beautifully. And you know, most people have a terrible experience with their first plane. And I, I've been, I'd used block planes before, but there was something that just like, I just flipped in my head that day. And, uh, and that's you know, 20 years, 23 years later, here we are. Um, it's just grown and gone crazy since then. And I've always been a reader, so that's the other thing, is that um, uh, read, 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 read. You know, television doesn't really do it for me. Um, but So I read, and, and thank goodness for the internet, because I could read more instead of watching cat videos. Chris is one of the most knowledgeable and hardest working people in the business. I, I don't even know what day it is of the week anymore, usually. Um, I only know because, you know, my wife goes to work and my kids go to school and I'm like, oh, it must be a weekday. Whether he is in his workshop downstairs at his Covington, Kentucky home or banging out books and blogs upstairs, he lives and breathes woodworking. Years ago, he made a name for himself making his way up the ranks at Popular Woodworking Magazine. While working there, he launched a little side business that down the road had him making a very big decision. Uh, 2007, I started Lost Art Press uh, as a way to, uh, you know, I mean, I write so much that I had to have an outlet for stuff that they had no use for. And that happened to be really esoteric, what they saw as esoteric hand tool stuff. And so that was 2007. And after a few years, uh, you know, this little business just sort of grew. Inside this peaceful Charleston, South Carolina workshop, Mary May works her magic. Her precision and patience always pays off creating masterpieces set in wood and in stone. Three-dimensional art was something that came natural to Mary, even at an early age. It was Halloween and we were having a pumpkin carving contest. And uh, where everybody else was doing these, uh, you know, the, cro the little triangle for the eyes and the, you know, toothless grin and all of that, I peeled the, um, the pumpkin, the skin off the pumpkin, and I actually made it so the nose stuck out and the ears stuck out and the lips stuck out. And I, I still had the little eyes that were cut out so you could have the, the candle inside and the mouth that was cut out. But everything was more realistic and three-dimensional. And, uh, you know, my friends are like, Mary, why don't you just carve a normal pumpkin like everybody else? <laughs> and uh, I thought, I don't know, it just came. <laughs> and that was when I was about 11 or 12 years old. So there was obviously something there that was a little bit stranger than <laughs> the, the other kids in the neighborhood. We also showcased the stories of three Society of American Period Furniture Maker Cartouche Award winners. Alf Sharp, who we mentioned earlier, retired orthopedic surgeon Jeff Justice, who has carved and built jaw-dropping period pieces, and Ronnie Young, who gives us a tour of his version of one of the most beautiful pieces of American furniture. I like this chest very much. I saw it for the first time, the original, at the Williamsburg uh, Colonial Williamsburg Museum up on the second floor, they have the original of this chest. It was made originally in Charleston, South Carolina by a cabinet maker named Thomas Elf. The outstanding thing about this chest, of course, is the fretwork along the top. The uh, Lazy 8 fretwork there just under the cove molding at the top is a Thomas Elf example of um, something that he would have put on his chest. This chest is mahogany. I was lucky enough to get some really nice mahogany veneer that matches all the way down from the top drawer all the way to the bottom. Uh, this veneer is old veneer. So the veneer you get today is so thin, it's difficult to work with. This veneer was probably cut in the 60s. What's and the thickness? It's about, I would guess, somewhere a little under a 32nd. It also has some features in it that are a little different. It has a butler's drawer. Drawer pulls out. <laughs> and turns into a desk. This piece of furniture would have sat in the front hall of a fine home uh, in Charleston and would have uh, been the place where the butler or, or 
matron of the house kept all her information. These little cubby holes and drawers would have kept uh, different things that they needed to run the house. Letters as they would receive, uh, bills, that sort of thing. And then when you are not using it as a desk, you can close it up and it slides right back in place. We've been fortunate to spend moments with a wide range of masters, from popular TV woodworkers to some you may have never heard of, from those building exquisite pieces to those who chose a more colorful and imaginative route, from those in the prime of their life and career to those who are well-established and young at heart. Just like the man who has spent eight decades in this craft and known all over as the Dean of Woodworkers, 98-year-old Al Hudson. I would just like to be remembered as a, as a decent human being that loved his fellow men. I love to teach woodworking. I love to pass along what little knowledge I have of this marvelous craft. I love to pass it on and just be remembered as someone who enjoyed helping someone else learn how to do good woodworking. Well, thank you for watching. Hopefully you have learned a thing or two and have been inspired by some of the greatest men and women in the field of woodworking. We could not have done this show without you. So thank you very much. Well, that does it for this episode and it does it for the series. I'm Charles Brock and I will always be a Highland woodworker.